something else that is critical. Because basic units are definitions, a new definition for a basic unit would not be right or wrong. A new definition would only be different. Imagine two competing sets of basic units, set A and set B. This would imply that there are two types of physics, physics A and physics B. This is just like Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometry. Physicists could unify physics with either set of basic units, A or B. Neither type of physics would be right or wrong. Each type would only be different. However, one of the types of physics might have an advantage over the others in the sense that it might be easier to learn, just like Euclidean geometry is easier to learn than other geometries. This is the big advantage of my new physics. My new physics is like our old physics from before Einstein, it is like that simple Euclidean geometry. In recent years, the physics that has been used is the physics of Einstein. That physics relies on relativity. Relativity uses a circular definition of time. It is a more difficult type of physics. It is difficult and non-intuitive, just like how non-Euclidean geometry is harder to visualize. The next idea is another critical one. It is simple. This simple idea is critical to existing in our modern world. How do you measure something's length? The answer is simple. You compare the object's length to your defined standard. You compare one length to another. Here is a simple example. This is my ruler. It is one unit of length. Let's assume that I call this length not a yard, not a foot, but a Nordberg. It is my definition. Here is a stick that I'm going to measure. I compare the length of the stick to the length of my ruler. You end up with a fraction. One, two, three, four. Its length is four. Next, how do we measure something's motion? We do it in the same way we measure lengths. We compare one object's motion to our standard of motion. We compare one motion to another motion. First, let me show you this with a simple example. Here are two points on this table, point A and point B. I want to move my finger from point A to point B in 10 seconds. I simply compare how fast I'm moving to the motion on the timepiece. Starting now, moving, and stopping. Next, let me show this to you with a simple graphic. In this graphic, we have two lines. One is a shorter line. It represents a slower motion. One line is longer. It represents a faster motion. In this case, our standard of motion is represented by the shorter line. In other words, the object is moving faster than our standard. Think about that detail. If our standard of motion is slow, slower than the speed of light, then our moving object can travel faster than the standard. For example, here's a range of motions. The maximum motion is a motion that is moving to the left at the speed of light. The maximum motion is also a motion that is moving to the right at the speed of light. In between these two maximum motions is a wide range of motions. What if our standard of motion is moving to the right at two tenths the speed of light? Thus, an object could be moving to the right faster than our standard. For example, four times faster than our standard at eight tenths the speed of light. In this example, our object is moving four times as fast as our standard. Our fraction is four divided by one. In my opinion, that is improper. That is easy to remember because mathematicians call fractions larger than one improper fractions. 
Therefore, any motion with a value greater than 1 is wrong. To be correct, all velocities, all speeds, should be fractions less than or equal to 1. This is new. This is not how we do things now. What is our standard of motion? We call it time. Through history, we have used one motion to measure all other motions. Historically, we have called one particular motion time. You know what it is. You know this motion. Think of it. What is that motion? Back to our frame. The, the number one in this frame represents the sun's motion. Throughout history, the motion we have used, the motion we have most often called time, has been the sun's apparent motion. However, from a physics point of view, the sun's motion is a bad motion for our definition. The sun's motion should not be called time. For a number of reasons, this motion, the motion of the sun crossing the sky, is not a good physics standard. For a moment, once again, think about how the sun appears to cross the sky. From the human point of view, we are standing still on Earth and the sun is moving across the sky. Even though, as we now know, the sun's motion is only an apparent motion, through most of history, most people have incorrectly thought the sun is moving across the sky. Again, when people generically use the word time, that name time refers to the sun's slow motion, the slow motion that she makes as she drifts across the sky. By the way, it is her actual slow motion, not this sped up version in my video clip. Sundials have shadows. As the sun crosses the sky, the shadow on the sundial moves. Essentially, the motion of the shadow mirrors the sun's motion. On this rooftop is a spire that forms a sundial. Notice the motion of the spire's shadow. Think of it this way. If you call the sun's motion time, then the motion on the sundial is equal to time. Note one other point. As a standard of motion, using any shadow of the sun's motion is very difficult and inconvenient to use. Think about everything that you see moving in this video. It would be impossible for the complex life going on below to be synchronized using the shadow. Imagine timing an automobile's engine using the sun's shadow. Imagine using the sun's shadow for the clock that is running your computer's central processing chip. That would be impossible. Imagine how all the people below would time their motions at night or when it is cloudy if all they could use is the sun's shadow. That would be impossible. A traditional timepiece has a dial face in three hands. They are the hour hand, the minute hand, and the second hand. This was a significant improvement over the sundial. Let's look at the most important detail that you need to realize about the motions of these three hands. First, imagine how the hour hand on a timepiece moves. As the sun appears across the sky once, the hour hand goes around the dial face two times. If the sun's motion is called time, then the hour hand's motion is twice as fast as time. This is simple, yet profound. Next, imagine how the minute hand on a timepiece moves. As the sun appears across the sky once, the minute hand goes around the dial face 24 times. If the sun's motion is called time, then 
this motion is 24 times as fast as time. Next, imagine how the second hand on a timepiece moves. As the sun appears across the sky once, the second hand goes around the dial face 1440 times. If the sun's motion is called time, then this motion is 1440 times as fast as time. Again, time is a specific motion. However, which motion is it? Is it the sun's motion or the motion of one of these hands? Through history, at one point or another, all of these motions have been called time. Obviously, this has confused people. Back to my frame. These three motions are labeled two, three, and four. Again, number one represents the sun's motion, number two represents the hour hand, number three represents the minute hand, and number four represents the second hand. Throughout history, all of these motions have been used as our standard for time. All of them have been used to measure other motions. All four of these motions have been called time. Keep in mind, all of these motions are slow, and that is bad. None of them move as fast as the speed of light. Let me emphasize a detail about the motion of the second hand. In the previous graphic, I called the second hand's motion number four. However, here I have labeled it 4A. You will see why next. Later in history, scientists defined the atomic second to be time. That is our present definition. That is our present problem. Thus, in our frame, the solar second is 4A and the atomic second is 4B. As you are surely aware, there is a very slight fractional difference between a solar second and an atomic second. However, these two motions are almost identical. The solar second is almost exactly equal to the atomic second. Even though an atomic second is extremely precise, being much more consistent than a solar second, these two motions are almost identical. Also, keep this in mind. Neither of these two motions travels at the speed of light. There's absolutely no doubt about it. An atomic second is definitely not the same thing as the speed of light. Why is that important? Because scientists now define the atomic second as their definition for time, which is a huge mistake. Future scientists are going to look back at this point in history and laugh at this. It really is that bad.